working class, but within that working class, we were migrant workers. And at the time that you know we were migrant workers, the migrant worker had you know very very little protection of any type, and we were just we would just wander around the Midwest looking for work. Every year around the middle of April, mm -hmm. we would get uh, in the back of some truck, and we'd you know take our few belongings, you know, las colchas, you know, some blankets and a kerosene stove, and that was it. And we'd you know. That was it. Seal up our, our house, you know, in Crystal City, mm -hmm. and uh, put boards in the windows and the doors and get in the truck and take off uh, points north. My father had uh, no education at all, either in Spanish or in English. Mm -hmm. And he taught himself how to read and write Spanish. And he could speak English. Not, not well, but he could speak it. My mother had a two year, you know, a second grade education. Mm -hmm. But she knew how to read and write Spanish well. And. Uh, speak English, you know, rather haltingly. And I think she's forgotten it already, but she could, she was the one that would write uh, for my dad in English, you know, mm -hmm. to uh, the different farms we were going to and help out with the contracts that we had. Yeah. But um, they always incul inculcated in us a, uh, a need for learning, uh, reading. They were very, you know, <coughs> they were very, um, they impressed upon us, you know, the need to read. Mm -hmm. And so they provided us with as, as you know as many reading materials as they could. Yeah. You know, I'm talking I, about newspapers, uh, magazines. They would ask you mm -hmm. know the farmers to give us so we could learn more things. So. Why Tomas Rivera? Born into poverty in South Texas, fated to a childhood of migrancy, accompanying his parents as they followed the harvest each year from Texas to Minnesota. How did this poor Mexican-American boy become a nationally recognized educational leader and an internationally acclaimed author whose prize-winning novel, And the Earth Did Not Swallow Him, would lead filmmaker Severo Perez to adapt it into a movie whose opening scene you just watched? We may never find the full answer about this remarkable man, but maybe we can grow to know him better by listening to the words of those who admired him and loved him. And we can contemplate the words of Tomas himself, like those we've just heard, as he recalled his parents and migrant childhood experiences. While still a young boy, Tomas found inspiration in magical people who would foster his love of learning, his thirst for knowledge, and his creativity. One of those magical people was an Anglo librarian in the small town of Hampton, Iowa. She became the subject of the award-winning children's book, Tomas and the Library Lady, written by Pat Mora, his University of Texas at El Paso colleague. Let's join little Tomas, standing alone in front of Hampton's imposing Carnegie Library. Tomas stood in front of the library doors. He pressed his nose against the glass and peeked in. The library was huge. A hand tapped his shoulder. Tomas jumped. A tall lady looked down at him. It's a hot day, she said. Come inside and have a drink of water. What's your name, she asked. Tomas, he said. Come, Tomas, she said. Inside, it was cool. Tomas had never seen so many books. The lady watched him. Come, she said again, leading him to the drinking fountain. First, some water. Then I will bring books to this table for you. What would you like to read about? Tigers, dinosaurs, he said. Tomas drank the cold water. He looked at the tall ceiling. He looked at all the books around the room. He watched the lady take the books from the shelves and bring them to the table. This chair is for you, Tomas, she said. Tomas sat down. Then very carefully, he took the book from the pile and he opened it. Tomas saw dinosaurs bending their long necks to lap shiny water. He heard the cries of a wild snake bird. He felt the warm neck of the dinosaur as he held on tight for a ride. Tomas forgot about the library lady. He forgot about Iowa and Texas. Tomas, Tomas, the library lady said softly. Tomas looked around. The library was empty. The sun was setting. The library lady looked at Tomas for a long time. She said, Tomas, would you like to borrow two books? I will check them out in my name. Tomas walked out of the library carrying his books. 
He ran home, eager to show new stories to his family. Papa Grande looked at the library books. Read to me, he said, Tomas. First, Tomas showed him the pictures. He pointed to the tiger. Que tigre tan grande, Tomas said, to, in, first in Spanish and then in English. What a big tiger. Read to me in English, said Papa Grande. Tomas read about the tiger's eyes shining brightly in the jungle at night. He roared like a huge tiger. Papa, Mama, and Enrique laughed. They came and sat near him to hear his story. Some days, Tomas went with his parents to the town dump. They looked for pieces of iron to sell. Enrique looked for toys. Tomas looked for books. He would put the books in the sun to bake away the smell. All summer, whenever he could, Tomas went to the library. The library lady would say, first a drink of water and then some new books, Tomas. On quiet days, the library said, come to my desk and read to me, Tomas. Then she would say, please teach me a new word in Spanish. Tomas would smile. He liked being the teacher. The library lady pointed to a book. Book is libro, Tomas said. Libro, she said, said the library lady. Pajaro, Tomas said, flapping his wings, flapping his arms. The library laughed. Bird, she said. On days when the library was busy, Tomas read to himself. He'd look at the pictures for a long time. He smelled the smoke at the Indian camp. He rode a black horse across a hot, dusty desert. And in the evenings, he would read the stories to Mama, Papa, Papa Grande, and Enrique. One August afternoon, Tomas brought Papa Grande to the library. The library lady said, Buenas tardes, senor. Tomas smiled. He had taught the library lady to say, Good afternoon in Spanish. Buenas tardes, senora, Papa Grande replied. Tomas said softly, I have a sad word to teach you today. The word is adios. It is, means goodbye. Tomas was going back to Texas. He would miss this quiet place, the cool water, the many books. He would miss the library lady. My mother sent this, sent this to, to thank you, said Tomas, handing her a small package. It is pan dulce, sweet bread. My mother makes the best pan dulce in Texas. The library lady said, how nice, how very nice. Gracias, Tomas, thank you. She gave Tomas a big hug. That night, bumping along again in the tiled, tired old car, Tomas held a shiny new book, a present from the library lady. Papa Grande smiled and said, more stories for the new storyteller. Tomas closed his eyes. He saw the dinosaurs drinking cool water long ago. He heard the cry of the wild snake bird. He felt the warm neck of the dinosaur as he held on tight for the bumpy ride. Encouraged by an Anglo librarian to read, explore, and imagine, young Tomas was also nourished by a local Mexican poet named Bartolo, who inspired him to compose his own stories. Decades later, as a maturing young scholar, Tomas wrote about Bartolo's significance in his seminal essay, Chicano Literature, Fiesta of the Living. At 12, I looked for books by my people by my immediate people and found very few. Very few accounts, in fact, existed. When I met Bartolo, our town's itinerant poet, and when on a visit to the Mexican side of the border, I also heard of him, for he would wander on both sides of the border to sell his poetry. I was engulfed with alegría it was an exultation brought on by the sudden sensation that my own life had relationships, that my own family had relationships, that the people I lived with had connections beyond those at the conscious level. It was Bartolo's poetry, or was it simply those papers that looked like his poetry that gave me awareness? Bartolo, Bartolo's poetry was my first contact with literature by my own people. It was to be my only contact for a long time. The bond that I felt with him and that I feel with other Chicano writers is the same. It is not pure nationality, Mexican, Chicano, Pocho, or otherwise. 
It is not because we take part in the same struggle against some injustices. It is not because we come from the same environment or social class, although all of these do manifest a vigencia of sorts. It is not, rather, that we sense that we are part of the same ritual. One has to go beyond prophecy and ritual and seek the nature of this bond in the act of remembering. Remembering because the past is what we have and it is all that we have. It is from the past that we are able to perceive, create, and give life of our ritual. It is from this that we derive strength that we can recognize our existence as human beings. Dios se bien, Dios se bien que estoy afuera, pero el día en que yo me muera, sé que tendrán que llorar, llorar y llorar, llorar y llorar. Sé bien que no me quisiste, pero vas a estar muy triste y así te vas a quedar. As Tomas developed a passion to write, he drew upon childhood memories to create indelible portraits of Chicano life. Tomas' compelling short story, The Salamanders, tells of his family's frustrating struggle to find work during a period of relentless Midwestern rainstorms, which had been causing crops to rot, until finally, on that day, by noon, the rain stopped and the sun came out, and we were filled with hope. Two hours later, we found a farmer that had some beets, which, according to him, probably had not been spoiled by the rain. But he had no houses or anything to live in. He showed us the acres of beets, which were still underwater, and he told us that if we cared to wait until the water went down to see if the beets had not rotted, and if they had not, he would pay us a large bonus per acre that we helped him cultivate. But he didn't have any houses, he told us. We told him we had some tents with us, and if he would let us, we would set them in his yard. But he didn't want that. We noticed that he was afraid of us. The only thing that, he, that we wanted was to be near the drinking water, which was necessary. And also, we were so tired of sleeping seated in the car. And of course, we wanted to be under the light that he had in his yard. But he didn't want us. And he told us that if we wanted to work there, 
we had to put our tents at the foot of the field and wait there for the water to go down. And so we placed our tents at the foot of the field and we began to wait. At nightfall, we lit up the lamp in one of the tents and then we decided for all of us to sleep in one tent only. I remember that we all felt so comfortable being able to stretch our legs, our arms, and falling asleep was easy. The thing that I remember so clearly that night was what awakened me. And I felt what I thought was the hand of one of my little brothers. And then I heard my own screaming. I pulled his hand away and when I awoke, I found myself holding a salamander. And then I screamed and I saw that we were all covered with salamanders that had come out of the flooded field. And all of us continued screaming and throwing salamanders off our bodies. With the light of the lamp, we began to kill them. At first we felt nauseated because they, we stepped on them. They oozed milk and it seemed that they were invading us, that they were invading the tent as though they wanted to reclaim the foot of the field. I don't know why we killed so many salamanders that night. The easiest thing to do would have been to climb quickly into our car. Now that I remember, I think we also felt the desire to recover and reclaim the foot of the field. I do remember that we began to look for more salamanders to kill. We wanted to find more to kill more. I remember that I'd like to take the lamp to seek them out and to kill them very slowly. It may be that I was angry at them for having frightened me. Then I began to feel that I was becoming part of my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters again. What I remember most about that night was the darkness, the mud, and the slime of the salamanders, and how hard they would get when I tried to squeeze the life out of them. What I have with me still is what I saw and felt when I killed the last one. And I guess that's why I remember the night of the salamanders. I caught one and examined it carefully under the lamp. Then I looked at its eyes for a long time before I killed it. What I saw and what I felt is something I still have with me, something that is very pure, original death. Childhood memories fueled much of Tomas' writing, but he also expanded his vistas to the broader Chicano experience. This he did, for example, in his epic poem, The Searchers. This long poem is important because it occupies a central place in Tomas Rivera's life and literary art. Consistently, in a number of videotaped and published interviews, Tomas spoke of migrant workers with admiration and respect. <clears throat> he told one interviewer that living among the migrant workers during the years between 1945 and 1955 made him very conscious of the suffering and strength and the beauty of migrant workers. This heightened consciousness, Tomas said, defined his role clearly to document his personal experiences with migrant workers. Beyond that, he wanted to give their experiences some kind of spiritual strength or spiritual history. I saw a lot of heroic people, he said, and I wanted to capture their feelings. <clears throat> In other interviews, Tomas again emphasized the spiritual strength of migrant workers and their complexity as fictional characters. In his novel, Tierra, for example, quote, like Sisyphus, they dare to search. Searching for work makes the migrants heroic beings. For creative people, books fall serendipitously into our hands. In 1958, Tomas discovered Américo Paredes' book with a pistol in his hand. Movingly, Tomas expresses generous indebtedness for Paredes' inspiration. 
Paredes documented one life for posterity, that of Gregorio Cortes, Tomas said. <clears throat> Inspired by his book, Tomas made it his mission to document the lives of migrant workers for posterity and to applaud their strong spirit of endurance and will to go on under the harshest of conditions. The searchers from which the following excerpts are taken is one of many tributes that Tomas paid to migrant workers with admirable generosity of spirit. That warm and generous spirit has been with us during this day's commemoration. How long, how long have we been searchers? We have been behind the door, always behind screens and eyes of other eyes. We longed to search, always longed to search. Naranja dulce, limón partido, dame un abrazo que yo te pido. We searched through our own voices and through our own minds. We sought with our words. A la víbora, víbora, de la mar, de la mar, por aquí pueden pasar. The search begun so many years ago, only to feel the loneliness of centuries, hollow, soundless centuries without earth. How can we be alone? How can we be alone when we are so close to the earth? Tierra eres, tierra serás, tierra te volverás. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Death. We searched in death. We contemplated the original and searched and savored it, only to find profound beckoning, a source that continued the search beyond creation and death. The mystery, the mystery of our eyes, the eyes we have as spiritual reflection, and we found we are not alone. We are not alone if we remember and recollect our passions through the years, the giving of hands and backs. Dale los hombros a tus hijos. We are not alone. Our eyes still meet with the passion of continuity and prophecy. We are not alone when we were whipped in school for losing the place in the book. Or for speaking Spanish on the school grounds, or when Chona, dear Chona, a mythic Chicana, died in the sugar beet fields with her eight-month child buried deep within her still. Or when that truck filled with us went off the road in Utah with screams eternally etched among the mountain snows, we were not alone in death. We were not alone in Iowa when we slept in wet ditches, frightened by salamanders at night reclaiming their territory, and we killing them to maintain it as our, then our only possession. Or in San Angelo when we visited the desiccated tubercular bodies of aunts and uncles, friends and lovers. We were not alone when we created children and looked into their eyes and searched for perfection. We were not alone when taught the magic of a smile, a kiss, and embrace each morning, and to feel the warmth and quiver of a human being. We were not alone murmuring the novenas Los Rosarios each night, warm milk, pan dulce, opened the evening door. Or when we walked all over Minnesota looking for work, no one seemed to care. We did not expect them to care. We were not alone after many centuries. How could we be alone? We searched together. We were seekers. We are searchers, and we will continue to search because our eyes still have 
the passion of prophecy. 1971 saw the publication of Thomas' most celebrated work, the prize-winning novel, Y no se la tragao, tragó la tierra, and the earth did not swallow him. Yet, as happens to many pioneering authors, cheers were accompanied by critiques. Let's listen as Tomas responds to criticism of his novel. Well, you've been discussed through criticism, mm -hmm. uh, mainly about your book, Tierra, that uh, you usually paint passive Chicano characters who, uh, who, who have admitted their uh, passiveness without doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, like in No <laughs> Solo La Tierra, how do you, defend, do you defend yourself on that? I don't think I need to defend myself, but I, I don't see what's so passive about, let's say, a young boy in Tierra who curses God. I mean, that's the ultimate condemnation. I mean, that's, a, that's your ultimate uh, leap of freedom. So you have this young man, 13, 14 years old, who is so frustrated because of the condition that he is in economically, uh, the sickness that, you know, that pervades through his family. And he is so frustrated, and there is no one that can alleviate any of his psychic or, or physical problems, that he goes, or he takes the ultimate step, and uh, does not condemn society in any sense, but he goes to the, to the ultimate, and he curses God, and nothing happens to him. Now, I don't see anything passive in that. I see that person as, you know, reaching the ultimate, you know, freedom in this sense. Uh, and uh, uh, the other characters I develop, there are some that are passive because there are passive uh, people within the Chicano community. There are those that are not. And what I try to render in my, in my writings is a consistent and honest and authentic perspective on all these people. Also, I'm writing about, or, you know, in Tierra, or No Se Lo Trago La Tierra, The Earth Did Not Part. In that book, I write about the migrant workers uh, within the historical context of 1945-1955. Uh, it's a period of time where, or when, there was no protection at all for the migrant workers. And the migrant workers were at the mercy of all types of exploitation. Uh, I don't find the migrant workers of that area passive at all. Uh, I find them a very heroic people. The fact that they were willing to migrate, you know, thousands of miles with no protection, in total isolation, and yet continued, you know, to go from farm, uh, from labor camp to labor camp, continued to protect their children, did not abandon their children, uh, continued to maintain their families intact. How could anyone call that passive? I mean, it's, it's really, you know, a heroic effort on a people that were, you know, that seemingly had no protection at all. Not seemingly, they didn't. Uh, they were a group of people who were worse than slaves. A slave, in a sense, is an investment, so you protect them. A migrant worker was not. You know, there was no protection because you had not provided, you had not invested any money in him. And yet, these people were able to maintain their families intact. Uh, if we want to get into heroics, you know, the, the, the women or the mothers uh, you know, who would work with the husbands in the field, pregnant women, uh, their children, you know, five or six years old, working in the fields. Uh, sometimes they were isolated or they were, they were not able to come back to, to their field home, you know, or field base in Texas, and they would stay in Minnesota, Ohio, whatever. Uh, they didn't give up. These people didn't give up. They were not passive at all. Tomas described his novel as a collage of experiences. For tonight's celebration, Carlos Morton has taken one chapter from the novel and has used it as the basis for his own original play, It Was a Silvery Night. A migrant camp somewhere in Texas. It is a silvery night and the moon is full. The sounds of crickets are heard. A young boy of 10 enters and speaks directly to the audience. Es una noche plateada, a silvery night, a good night to summon the devil. Yes, I've been thinking about it for a long time. 
Am I afraid? See, but I just have to find out if the devil really exists. And tonight is the night. The lights are out. My brothers and sisters are asleep. I can hear my father snoring in the other room. Mi mamá always complains about his snoring. Shh. I have to get to the front door without anybody waking up. I better take this clock with me. It's 11.50 p.m. They say you have to call out El Diablo exactly at midnight. See, si, a las meritas doce. I'm going to open the door. I hope it doesn't make too much noise. Lo del Diablo siempre me ha fascinado. Ever since they took me to see Tia Pana's pastorela at the church. Si, I said the church. <laughs> La iglesia. Why are you laughing? No se hagan fan de mí, eh? You think I speak funny? Pues no, I didn't say speak. I said speak, okay? So what's the matter with you? That's the way we talk in Texas, híjoles. Anyway, I was always curious as to what the Diablo looked like, you know? In, in the Christmas pastorela, Don Rayos played the Diablo. He wore a, a black cape with a black mask made of tin and red horns. Híjoles, qué susto. Ay, Dios mío. If you saw him in an alley, you'd run like hell. De volada. But I'm not afraid of the Diablo. And tonight, I'm going to call him out. Pasa lo que pasa. But first, I have to walk out past the other shacks in the migrant camp, past the outhouses, out by the Alamo Grove. I can't even see our house from here. Pues que casa ni que mi abuela. It's more like a chicken coop. De veras, mi familia y yo somos migrant workers who follow the pisca from Texas to Utah. Yeah, that's what I said, Utah. ¿Y dónde queda Utah? Pues yo no sé. Dicen que somewhere near Japón, yo no sé. Well, I better be careful where I step in this tall grass. It could be... I better be careful. The salamanders, something swirling around the grass. It could be a snake. Ay, Diosito. What time is it? Midnight. A ver, a ver. ¿Cómo le llamo? ¿Cómo le llamo? God, what if he appears? No, 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 it can't be. Maybe I better go back. No. Uh, but you know, he can't do anything to me. I'm not dead yet, right? No, all I want to know is the devil really exists or not, because if the Diablo doesn't exist, then there's no... I better not say that. I could be punished. Chihuahua. Okay, well, here I go. A ver, how do you call the Diablo? <coughs> Vamos a ver. Diablo. Diablo. Pingo. Chamuco. Lucifer. Satanás. Chupacabras. I don't hear anything, do you? Well, maybe I'm not trying hard enough. I think maybe I, I need to be nastier y más, como se dice, cabrón. Ah, bueno. Come out, mentiroso. I'm not afraid of you, atascado, borracho, asesino, puto. Pues chingate, pues, entonces. Y tu madre también, que está en vinagre, cabrón. Mira, nada, absolutamente nada. I knew it. There's no Diablo. He doesn't exist. What a relief. Chihuahua. I better get back. You know, one afternoon I lost a marble underneath Don Rayo's house, and I went underneath the crawl space to look for it, and there I found a cardboard box, and inside was a costume, the Diablo's costume. I shook off the dust and tried it on. Que travieso que no. 
That's why I, my mama always said, pues, ¿sabes qué? When I put on that costume, I became the Diablo. Oh, yeah, me creía muy chingón. Órale, a ver, ¿quieren pedo? No te metes conmigo, güey, porque te rompo la madre. Oh, oh, shit, here comes Don Rayo. Oh, hey, you, huerco mocoso, what are you doing? Quítate esa máscara. Oh, perdóname, Don Rayo. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Here, here. You sorry, you sorry, sax, you... Damesel, you don't play around with the Diablo, you know. You could get in all kinds of trouble. Acuérdate que hay muchos who called him out and live to regret it. I said I'm sorry, Don Tomas. Here. Okay, but you're playing with fire, chico, eh? Huerco. You don't die of... You could die of fright. Others, people who played with the Diablo have been overcome with fright and stopped talking as if their souls had left their bodies. For real, Don Rayo? You damn straight. Pues fíjate que one night out there by Cristal, se pusieron bien pedos unos vatos. Yeah, they called out the Diablo in the parking lot of La Rosa Tejana. Yeah, that Rosa Tejana was a bar de aquellas. Oh, you could dance to música norteña all night and drink Colorado Kool-Aid. Of course, I never did that. My vieja wouldn't let me, you know. Pero anyway, esos cabrones se creían muy machos. But the devil... The devil bided his time and didn't appear until later, much later. Oh, yeah, he got them one at a time. He picked them off like flies on a fly swatter, one by one, squished them, and then he pulled out their wings, así. No, 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 mijito, no se juega con el diablo. Entregas tu alma, you sell your soul. Ay, don Tomás, don Rayo, uh, what about you? Did you sell your soul? ¿Qué babosadas estás hablando, huerco? Well, didn't you pay the Diablo? That's different, menso. I just play acting in the pastorela. Don't you know it's only make-believe? Ah, chico este. Don Rayo, Don Rayo, Don Rayo. Oh, where did he go? Ay, Dios mío. Well, maybe he was right in saying that we shouldn't fool around with the Diablo, you know, because everything suddenly seems clear. Those who called out the Diablo and when insane did so not because they hadn't seen the Diablo. On the contrary, it's because the devil did not appear. El Diablo no apareció, just like me. Well, sort of. You know what I mean? Anyway, I better go to sleep. Hasta luego. <laughs> del templo un día llorona cuando al pasar yo te vi hermoso huipil llevaba su llorona que la virgen te creí hermoso huipil llevaba su llorona que la virgen te creí
Even as he wrote, Tomas began another career. Already a professor of Spanish and Spanish-American literature, he was drawn into university administration, becoming a vice president, first at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and later at the University of Texas at El Paso. Then, in the spring of 1979, Tomas was named chancellor of the University of California, Riverside, the first Mexican-American chancellor in UC history. On April 28, 1980, Tomas was inaugurated in an outdoor ceremony in the center of campus. Maybe as an omen of the future, a storm hit in the middle of the ceremony, the heaviest April 28th rainfall in 36 years. That rain denied Tomas the opportunity to deliver his inaugural address. Those here tonight are about to share a unique experience. You are going to hear Tomas' 1980 inaugural address, finally, exactly one quarter century after it was scheduled. I feel very fortunate today. My family's here. Many friends of our family are here. And I consider today's symbolic occasion a highlight in my life. I have many thanks to express to many people. Some are here today and some are not. I want to express thanks too to the many friends of our university and our campus. I'm happy to see so many people here today. Relati relatively speaking, I have had a short career in administration, but already it has been complete with fine and excellent memories and sad and trying ones. It is already complete and full with ideas and people who have cared to be involved with what is still considered the most noble of efforts, the transmitting and discovery of knowledge, the urging and urge of acts of creativity, and the development of human resources. I am indeed proud to be part of the University of California. I am very, very proud to join the destiny of UCR. There are many women and men of vision on this campus. We have, a, we have some of the finest minds on earth. We also have some of the finest students on earth. This campus has dignity and pride. This comes from a history of critical and analytical effort on the part of its faculty to maintain excellence above everything else. My nine months here have given me some of the finest moments of my life. I have, I have had exalted ones when I have sensed the type of education that our students receive. I can see that they will make a difference in our society. Likewise, I feel exalted as I have come to learn of the very excellent research, both basic and applied, that our faculty carries out. I have noted the total efforts of our fine support staff and their pride in this campus. My nine months here have given me some of the most trying moments also. We have people on our campus with courage and independence. To work with people of such independence is the most trying thing. I am personally glad to have this opportunity. There is much to do here. There is much to develop. There will be some euphoria and much strain. We must get on with the job of the further development of UCR, its mission and its constituency. To the faculty, to the students and staff, I pledge to you the best of my efforts and energy. I also pledge to you that I will act fairly and with justice. I am committed to the further development of UCR as an institution with a full identity and as an institution that is second to none in its excellence. Thank you. Cuatro mil pas tan solo han quedado del ranchito que era mío ay, 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 ay. y 
aquella casita tan blanca y bonita, lo triste que está. Los poteros están sin ganado, toditito se ha acabado. Thomas' rise to the UCR Chancellorship thrust him further into the national limelight as an educational leader and a symbol of Chicano achievement. His educational vision and his symbolic importance became the subject of a paper written by Joseph Castro and two of his University of California Santa Barbara colleagues. Tomas Rivera frequently spoke of his vision for UCR to become an organization of interwoven patterns of beliefs, values, and practices throughout the disciplines. In particular, his attempts to change the organizational culture of the campus were aimed towards the inclusion of students of color and other disadvantaged students. One small yet distinct example of such a gesture was the selection of a Latino song played at his inauguration ceremony. Tomas's Latino background was indeed a significant factor in how he viewed his role as chancellor and also how others viewed his role as chancellor. He often spoke of the value of higher education and in particular for students of color and other disadvantaged students. He recognized that he was perceived as a role model for the Latino community, yet would often try to place more emphasis on the need for increased access to education for all students. While he spent his days in the same manner as other university leaders, namely presiding over important events, receiving guests, and focusing on global policy issues, he spent many of his evenings speaking to groups of students and parents, often Latino and other groups of color, about the importance of education. Many of these events were in Riverside, but often he would travel many miles to communities throughout California and other states to give speeches to large and small audiences. Tomas was a strong advocate of improving access to education for students of color and other disadvantaged students. His vision for the Latino community was to build what he referred to as the Mexican-American middle class. He called upon the community's need to develop a sense of civic morality. He felt that in order to do that, the historical pattern of discrimination in the educational system must first be acknowledged. 
It is evident that Tomas was aware that his appointment as the first Latino chancellor was highly significant and symbolic. Yet, he realized that he was just one person and that it would take a community to develop change for Latino students or any students of color. His goal was to teach others in higher education about the concept of an abrazo so that the gap between the university's expectations and students' expectations would be reduced for all students. Tomas believed changing the attitude and underlying values among higher education administrators, faculty, and staff was imperative to changing the patterns of access to higher education for students of color and students of disadvantaged backgrounds. He also called upon the community to accept responsibility for changing the socialization process at home for their children to continue their education. His perception as a role model for the Latino community, coupled with the fact that he was the first Latino chancellor, created a significant factor for Tomas to overcome. The expectations of any chancellor are high. The expectations of Tomas were even higher and were amplified by the expectations of the Latino community. In a speech at the University of Texas, San Antonio, Tomas remarked, when I became the chancellor at the University of California, Riverside, there were a lot of people that were very concerned. They had never heard of me. They were concerned for what might take place. But the basic concern was that UCR was an elitist institution. And here I was coming from a populist state university that does not supposedly, does not have supposedly an elitist attitude. How could a Chicano trained in Oklahoma be president of UC Riverside? After my first meeting with the Academic Senate, I was interested in seeing what had been the effect of my first meeting with the faculty. One of the professors came to speak with me about it, and he said, I heard something really funny. I'm going to have to tell you this, and I don't mean this in any derogatory way. But after the meeting, one faculty member was talking to another, and he said, you know, I can understand why Governor Brown put a Chicano in as chancellor at Riverside for political reasons, but did he have to look so much like a Chicano? What is it that you enjoy the most about your, your new life, if I can say new life? It's not really a new life, but... What I enjoy the most? Yeah. Well, meeting different types of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think meeting different types of people, uh, viewing uh, and attempting to solve problems from a, from a total perspective, uh, sensing you know, the, whole, uh, the whole institution you know, that I'm heading, uh, seeing the whole thing is something that I enjoy very much. So I think it's people and the job itself and the dynamics of, uh, of the whole total operation mm -hmm. is, is something that I truly enjoy. Of course, you always have all these other appointments also. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you, you have, uh, uh, it gives you, a, you know, I, I get a better picture of the whole mm -hmm. thing. Not just, not just the institution, it carries on to society itself. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I'm more sensitive, I, I'm more, I think I'm more in touch with more of society than I was before. Let me ask you before. something else. Since I ask you what you like the most, mm -hmm. what do you like the least? What really bugs you sometimes that I think you the, wish you could change? Yeah, well, probably the, the, the worst thing, the thing that, it has, that really upsets me is, uh -huh. is uh, the unfairness of people, you know, the selfishness in people. How do you mean? Well, uh, in, in, you know, um, I guess human beings are, are very, very selfish. We're all very selfish and we're all very unfair sometimes. And uh, I see that often, and that's very hard to take. You see it often where? Uh, well, you know, uh, coming to me uh, from every direction. You know. uh, Why? Well, yeah, your position, yeah. I guess. So. Like what? 
What? Can you give me an example? No. Well, sure. You know, okay, give me an example. If, you know, something, uh, something happens here at the institution and we get some irate citizen calling in saying, you know, blaming the whole university or saying that student, that all students are a certain way or that all faculty are a certain way or that society is rotten. <laughs> that's, you know, that's hard to take because, there, you know, you, you come in touch with so many fine individuals that for someone to tell you that the institution is not worth anything or that students don't, you know, are, are, are bad, mm -hmm. uh, it's just unfair. Tomas' tenure as chancellor went well beyond vision and symbolism. It was also marked by achievement, even breakthroughs, as described in a paper written by former UCR Vice Chancellor James Erickson. What Tomas Rivera achieved in his all too brief but productive five-year tenure as chancellor has had a lasting and most positive impact on the university, the city of Riverside, and the Inland Empire region. He served with such passion, quality, and dignity. And his national and global respect have also contributed to the continuing nature of his legacy. As the University of California System's first Hispanic and first underrepresented chancellor, it was vital, as it is with any pioneer or paysetter, that Tomas was effective in his role, for he recognized he would be measured with much more scrutiny than any of his peers. In reality, his leadership and his performance had to be exemplary so that others could follow the same path to the top of the higher education ladder. If he failed, it would have been inevitably deferred and perhaps prevented the progress of other underrepresented leaders within the University of California and the nation as a whole. Not only did he excel in his performance as chancellor, but by his example and by his bold appointments at UC Riverside, he ensured that others would have opportunities that previously had been denied people of color. His most important appointment as UCR's chancellor was his chief academic officer, the executive vice chancellor of the campus. He selected Dr. Carlton Bovell, a respected longtime UCR biology professor. Dr. Bovell was also the first African American to serve in that role on any UC campus. This appointment also ensured that UC Riverside was the only comprehensive university in America whose top two officials were underrepresented leaders. To some, even in the university community, the thought of two minority members leading the campus was greeted with criticism, with skepticism. There was a feeling that they or the campus would not be accepted in some quarters. But both men led with sensitivity and understanding and a commitment to provide opportunities for faculty and students that few leaders then or now possess. It was also Tomas Rivera, who a short time later appointed the first woman vice chancellor for administration in the history of the University of California system. Eleanor Montague served in that role and thus assumed responsibilities for such traditional male roles as the physical plant supervision, the police, and budget planning. Until these pivotal appointments, few minorities and women in the Inland Empire were entrusted with the leadership positions they deserved or for which they were qualified for. How dramatically that has changed in large part because of the example and the inspired standards of Tomas Rivera. Tomas's quiet humility, his gentle demeanor as a widely acclaimed poet, and his unassuming personal style belied a fire which motivated him to rise from his roots as a migrant worker to a man who was to be honored by then President Reagan as the National Educator of the Year. The beloved name of Tomas Rivera now adorns public schools, university libraries, endowed chairs, and public policy centers throughout California and Texas. 
On the UC Riverside campus, the Rivera name is permanently memorialized through the plaza outside the administration building, the major library, and an endowed chair in literature. Tomas Rivera is proof that one very special human being can make a difference in our society. As Chancellor, Tomas Rivera touched many lives. Mary Fleer, then director of the UCR Children's Center Preschool, recalls, one year we asked him to play Santa for the children. We didn't know what to expect. I mean, here he was, the chancellor of the university. But he put on a Santa suit and came. We'll remember it forever. Yet, as do all university leaders, Tomas encountered campus controversies. In May 1984, the UCR Academic Senate was scheduled to address the Senate Advisory Committee's motion to form a new ethnic studies program. If established, ethnic studies would replace the existing Chicano Studies and Black Studies programs, whose faculties opposed the motion. Four days before the Senate meeting, students staged a protest against the elimination of Chicano and Black Studies. The protest occurred on May 6th at the annual UCR Open House, while Tomas welcomed visitors to the campus. The children who are here with their parents, children who are here without their parents, I want to welcome faculty, staff, students, administration, our group here. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here today with us. And I, I want to invite you to come again next year. We're going to be here again. Thank you.
Yet a life cut so short. Thus it was with Tomas Rivera. On May 10th, the Senate met, debated the ethnic studies proposal, and decided to send it out for a mail ballot, which would approve the motion, thereby ending 15 years of the Chicano and Black Studies program at UCR. The day after the meeting, Tomas was stricken with a heart attack. Five days later, on May 16, 1984, he died at age 48. That same day, his Department of Literature and Languages colleague, Jean-Pierre Baricelli, wrote the following letter, a tone poem to his fallen compatriot. Tomas Rivera, more than a chancellor, more even than a poet, human being. With a serious joviality, he said, delighting in a recent party, it was also human. Simultaneously with being introduced, Tomas became a friend, gracious, worldly, genuine, human. A man of family love, first and foremost. Then of poetic sensibility and administrative wisdom, he spanned several in opposing worlds. This alone meant uncommon stress, for one world alone generates untoward units of urgency and pressure. Always with altruism, with never a trace of self-serving motivation, he underscored education, the only promise for humankind, outreach programs, the interfacing basis of social and academic communication, ethnic justice, the very mortar of American life, Above all, devotion, be it to family, to principle, or to cause. For these reasons, he could not say no to worthy enterprises, because he felt he had no right to say no. It was not human to say no to the Chicano cause, still in need of successes such as he represented. It was not human to say no to the goals of education, usually in need of humanists, of his persuasion and caliber. It was not human to say no to domestic and social desires, always in need of the kind of warmth he could bring to them. Tomas Rivera, an exceptional human being whose life has been cut short by his exceptional humanity. He was surely not ready to leave us. His passing away is simply not right. His beloved Concha knows that. But we have inherited a message from this poet chancellor for whom standing up for himself meant standing up for human values, refusing to be crushed by the world's vagaries. We, who lapse ever more deeply into disaffection and desultoriness in the throes of this world's anomalies, are now strengthened by the modest fact that he walked among us for a while. And more by example than by urging, he inspires us to rededicate those creative energies, latent and even the most evasive conscience, to the pursuit of the human and all of its ramifications. This is his legacy, and therefore his continuing life. On May 19th, a memorial service was held 
in front of the UCR administration building at a spot now known as Rivera Plaza. Speaker after speaker extolled Hamas. Let's listen to the words of Graduate Student Association President Henry Martinici, Associated Students International Coordinator Rick Davis, and Mexican Consul Amarincesio Rodriguez. Several years back, the Graduate Student Association had the idea of perhaps helping graduate students to further their own careers by helping them to get to conferences where they could show the scholarship that they had attained at UCR. Our funds were very limited, and Chancellor Rivera, upon hearing of our plight, stepped forward, not just with the funds that he controlled at the university, but knowing the need even reached into his own pocket to further the cause of scholarship and education at this campus. During his tenure here, the chancellor was called on to make several very difficult decisions, but he could always be counted on to listen to all concerned with care and compassion and make what he felt were the best decisions for the general campus as a whole. I don't know why those most valuable to us are taken so early in life. But I do know that our campus community has lost a good, honest man who cared. And for this, he will be missed most by the student body, and this student in particular. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rivera, for sharing your husband with us. He never tried to hide that he was a poor child, son of illiterate parents subjected to so many economic and social limitations. But he was able to accomplish in few years and by force of his personality, a brilliant though short career. Tomas did in 48 years what many people wouldn't dream of attaining in 96. But it hasn't ended. His cause lives and will continue to live as long as those of us, who, of us who admired him so much don't let him die. It is the paradox of the grain of wheat, which either remains unique in its sterility or which allowing itself to die in the furrow germinates. Grain converted into spike. Tomas dies as such and lives as such on the condition that we, embracing his cause, continue to make it live. So, after having ended this service, let us go forth, resolved to spread his message. Let the urgency of acquiring an education reach all the young people so that we can attain a middle class with truly high civic values, confident in itself, sure of its historical destiny, and capable of establishing for future generations the dreams of Dr. Tomas Rivera. Concha, thank you very much. As the memorial service drew to a close, silence turned into total silence when Tomas's widow, Concha, took her place beside the podium. I want to thank everybody that has been concerned and for the love that you had expressed. I want to thank you for the calls, the flowers, the telegrams, the visits during Tomas's illness, and during his death. I want you to know that Tomas believed and loved this university. He was very proud of it. It was his life. He worked very hard at it to make it better and better. He did not put into 100%. 
That's all he could give, but he gave 200% to it. He gave his life for it. I hope that all of you here, they are part of the university, this great university, will put aside your differences and unite, and all of you will work together. And do not forget what the mission of this university is, a university for all the people, regardless of color, race, or sex. Those were Tomas's goals. I thank you for this beautiful memorial on behalf of my children, on behalf of Tomas's family, his mother, his brothers. Thank you. My friends, let's welcome Concha Rivera. Uh, not seen any videos uh, uh, since Toma of Tomas since he died, and um, or heard his voice. So the whole, the entire evening has been very difficult. However, this last video brought back all the past emotions, the pain, the anxiety, the fear, the agony, the loneliness, and the cruel tragedy. Even today, I don't know how or where I got the strength to do that. I can barely stand enough. Yet, this is after the rain, and we're here to celebrate a life, although sadly shortened. Its impact continues to be so profound and immeasurable. The effects are subtle and far-reaching. Tomás Rivera continues to live through the minds and hearts of many people, his family, his friends, his students, his colleagues, and everyone that came in contact with him. He was the kind of man that touched the people that he met with his smile, warmth, and wit, and laughter. Tomas lived through his accomplishments, successes, and failures. But most importantly, he lives through his writings in the legacy he left for the community he loved. His physical life is over, but his spiritual life is here with us. And he will continue to be as long as we remember him. Remembering our common experiences keep us, in, keep us connected and strong. And that's why we are here tonight. And gracias for joining us to celebrate Tomas Rivera's life. Thank you very much. <clears throat> 